It's because of amazing grace that we've come here to gather today to remember and celebrate the life of Alan Pope, husband to Mother Joyce, father to myself and my sister Karen. My name is Graham Pope, and on behalf of my mother, my sister and I, I would like to thank you for all coming today to honour God, uh, Dad's life. God's life too. <laughs> the definition of a le legend is someone who leaves behind an unforgettable impression on others. They touch lives, they're remembered, and they're cherished. My dad was a legend. And your attendance today is a testament to that. I would like to thank everyone who has helped to make today possible. Leanne, the chaplain, here at Bethesda, for the support and prayers that she's given us, Paula Marston at Martin, John Corbett and Joan Corbett, John and Rhonda Crooks, and all those that have visited and supported Mum and my sister and I. Hilary and Teresa, for their friendship of sharing the photos of my dad as Santa. George and Barbara, for their constant support and friendship, and to both to both mum and dad, and especially to George, who has walked the journey with dad these last couple of years, and he would take dad to his appointments and treatments. Lastly, I would especially like to thank the staff of Bethesda, of Bashan, for the wonderful people that you are. You have cared for mum and dad during this time. You have shown such love in a way and have cared for them both and looked after the Dad in these last weeks and months. You're all legends, and you've all touched our hearts. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Leanne Hill. I'm the chaplain of Bethesda Gardens. It is my honour and privilege to conduct the Thanksgiving and memorial service for Alan Polk. When I spoke to Joyce about how she would like the service to be conducted, she was very clear. It is not to be a maudlin time, but one for thanksgiving and rejoicing. While we do mourn the passing of Alan, we are to take our lead from Joyce and along with her, recognise that Alan is no longer suffering, but in the presence of his saviour. Please bow your heads with me as I commit our service to the Lord. Gracious and almighty Father, we come together to remember and give thanks for the life of Alan Pope. As we hear of his life and his joy in living, may we be inspired by his faith and trust in you. As we mourn his passing, we do not grieve in vain, for we know that the hope Alan had is one that is available to us all. Please comfort us in our sadness and bring hope in our sorrow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Alan lived an amazing life. 
And Graham, his son, has written a story about his life, which I'm going to read to you. Just remove some of these sheets of paper. Alan Polk was born on the 6th of January, 1933, the youngest of nine brothers to John Barrett Polk, MM, and Lillian F Florence Polk, Ni Hannah. Alan was born 21 weeks premature, weighing just 2.5 pounds, or 1.13 kilos, and his mother was told he would not survive. His mother took him home, and his first cot was a shoebox stuffed with cotton wool and put in a fireplace to keep warm and fed him with an eyedropper. Alan not only survived against the odds, but lived for 90 years. Alan was born in Holm, Manchester, England. He left school at the age of 14 and went to work with a carpenter. He then worked in a butcher's and then in a ceramic shop and learnt from the owner who, when he found out that Alan's father was going to take the family to Australia, asked if he could adopt Alan and that he would teach him the trade. Obviously, the answer was no, because in 1949, Alan's father and brother paid passage to Australia as 10 pound poms, bringing Alan and one of his brothers, Frank, down under. Two more brothers, Leslie and Eric, joined the family late. His other brothers, Jack, William, Harold, remained in England, and two other brothers, twins Edward and Tommy, died in infancy. In 1952, at age 19, Alan met 18-year-old Joyce Hitchens at a church, church dance in Kingsgrove. Alan would turn up in army uniform and would cut the rug with style. One night, Joyce was sitting with friends when Alan made his way across the room, exciting all the girls, all hoping to dance with him. His choice was Joyce, and they soon started dating. Alan was quite the Prince Charming and would defend Joyce when other boys would not treat her with respect, dealing with them in no uncertain terms. On one occasion, Alan turned up at Joyce's place to take her out. He was in uniform with his rifle in hand. Joyce, Joyce's mother said, you can come in, but leave your gun at the door. Alan and Joyce dated for about a year before Alan started to get more serious and began to talk about marriage. Joyce wasn't ready for such commitment and called things off. About a year later, Alan found out that Joyce was in hospital and visited her there. He asked her to a party and she said yes. Alan was still keen and loved Joyce and talked about marriage again. Joyce told him she would tell him when she made up her mind. One day whilst walking, Joyce turned to Alan and said, yes. Alan said, yes, what? And Joyce said, yes, I'll marry you. Three months later, on the 10th of September, 1955, Alan and Joyce were married. This year would celebrate 68 years together. Alan and Joyce eventually settled in Picnic Point and raised their family, instilling in the children good values. But in 1959, at the Billy Graham Crusade, Alan became a Christian. Alan and Joyce found a church in Padstow Heights Baptist, where Alan would soon become choir master and would often sing solos. Most memorable was the old rugged cross. He, along with Joyce, have participated in the life of the churches they've been members of, running youth groups, boys brigade leaders and church elders. Alan worked very hard, sometimes three jobs a day. He would leave early in the morning, then come home, change and go to his day job, then come home and go out in the evening to work again. On weekends, he would do jobs as well as helping people to build kitchens and bathrooms. Alan's main occupations were cabinet making and wardsman at both Lidkin Hospital, when it was a veterans hospital, and Liverpool Hospital. Alan thrived as a wardsman and his passion to care for people shone through. 
The most notable moment when he was working at Liverpool Hospital was in September 1984. Alan had the opportunity to witness and show God's love to one of the Comanchero bike members who was wounded in the Milpera massacre. Alan helped the young man to pray and held his hand and prayed with him. That gentleman later became a Christian. Alan's working life was cut short due to illness after not having the best recovery from bypass surgery and retired at 53 years of age. Alan entered early retirement and Alan and, and Joyce eventually sought up and moved to Foster, Tuncurry, where Alan got to enjoy his hobby of fishing, as we see here. They later moved to Tari, where Joyce knitted the history of fashion. Now that's another story. I must find out about that. And each Christmas, they would decorate the windows with the display. Busloads of people would come to see the display, and Alan would love to meet them and take them window to window and tell them the story of the characters. Then whilst mum served Christmas cake, dad would entertain the neighbours and visitors singing songs and carols whilst playing his keyboard. Alan has always loved to make others happy and to entertain people. Living here in Morissette, Alan would play his keyboard and sing in front of the chemists every Christmas. He would play Santa for a friend who had a Christmas street party, handing out presents and bringing smiles to the adults and joy to the children. Even in these last times, Alan would love to play his keyboard for the residents at Bethshem. He was ever the performer and really missed his profession as an entertainer. Alan's life might have been cut short, but for a determined mother, and more so because God had a plan and purpose for his life. One that was lived to bring joy, happiness and hope. In his own way, he shared the love of Jesus with those he came into contact, even when it was not direct. His hugs were comforting. He had a charm in his smile that made everyone love him. He will be greatly missed by all of us. Well, if we didn't know Alan very well before, we certainly do now. We are going to be singing our first song, Be Still My Soul. If you would like to remain seated, please do so. If you could stand, please join me.
Please be seated. I would now like to ask Martin Tenbrink, who is the pastor of Dawson Baptist Church, where Alan and Joyce were members and are members. And so it's my honour to have him here today. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne. And what a joy it is to be here and to be representing Doyleson Baptist Church. Joyce, our condolences. We're all thinking of you, praying for you and the family gathered here today. It's a joy to bring to you a reading, two readings this afternoon, both from John's Gospel. The first one is John chapter 14, verses 1 to 4. Listen carefully to these words because Jesus is speaking words that are directed at us. He says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. And he says further in, in John chapter 11, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you, I'd now like to ask Rhonda Crooks to bring us a solo, The Old Rugged Cross, one of Alan's favourite. Thank you, Rhonda. Alan, Alan loved his music, didn't he? And he was remembered for um, the solos that he sang, particularly back in the days of the Padstow Heights Baptist Church. And this is one of those songs that meant so much to him. Oh, 
Thank you for that beautiful tribute to Alan. I can just picture him singing along in heaven. I would now like to ask both Carolyn and Graham to present their eulogies. I'd just like to share with you what you already know about Alan. Um, you know that he was a generous beyond a fault. He was so generous and he loved everybody so much. Maybe not his mother-in-law, but everybody else he loved <laughs> so much. And um, he couldn't give enough of himself to the people around him. And I think some of you may have experience of that, whether it's just a bar of chocolate or whether it's his time or whether it's a joke or a, a really terrible limerick um, uh, and, uh, and terrible jokes and actually stories, if you knew him long enough to know he's actually, <laughs> this happened and that happened, um, that he was always um, looking for joy in life. He was always looking for fun. He looked for the best in people. Um, and uh, really, he didn't, he didn't know how to, to uh, think any other way. So I think he was a very generous, wonderful man. And as a child, he was um, loving us children so much. He was just, I think he felt privileged to have us and we felt blessed to, to have him as a father. I felt cherished my whole life. And um, I wish every child could grow up feeling wanted and cherished the way we did. But um, that's all I want to share. That um, he was a magnificent man. He may have been just an ordinary man, but he was my father and he was a good one. Well, Carolyn sort of sewed that up. I got my eulogy a little bit around stories of memories. Because what we're looking at today is our memories. So my dad, as I've said before, was a legend. He has touched the hearts and lives and brought joy and happiness to so many. All of you are here today because of what my dad meant to you. He has given us all moments that we will remember and cherish in our hearts as long as we live. These last weeks have been a time of reflection and recall of the moments spent with my dad and I will cherish them. I wish as adults we would be able to remember the comfort of being held with all the love that a father holds in his heart when we are infants. Maybe the way we might remember such love given to us is in our own experience as parents and the love, protection, and pride we have when we are hold, when he, we are held, and, and when we hold our own sons and daughters when they come into our lives. As a young boy, I remember Dad taking me to Saturday matinee at Panania Theatre on his push bike. I would sit on the crossbar. He must have been fit because he, there was hills in Picnic Point, real hills. And I never remember getting off the bike to walk. He was a real father, and it was a real father and son time. We would watch news clips, cartoons, and the main feature, which is usually Laurel and Hardy, or the Three Stooges, and we'd have ice cream. Dad loved fishing. And he would take me to the George's River to catch the big one. I don't ever remember catching anything at the George's River. On one occasion, once Dad was able to drive, we went fishing at Tom Ugly's Bridge in Sylvania. Well, I caught what seemed to be the great catch, only to land the monster of the sea on the wharf. It frightened me so much I ran for my life off that wharf and back to the car. I refused to go back on that wharf after that. It was an octopus. <laughs> Scared for my life, I was. Later in life, 
When Dad and Mum moved to Foster, Dad tried to teach me to catch blackfish. There's a real knack to it, and Dad had it down pat. I had gotten over my fear of sea monsters, but still, fishing was not my forte. But the time spent with my dad was always great. Dad's other love was entertaining, and he was very musical, although he could not read a note of music. At different times, we've had drums in the lounge room. He's played piano accordion, his famous bones, mouth organ, ukulele, and I even remember in our backyard with a mop on his head and a grass skirt on doing the hula hula playing the ukulele. <laughs> and of course, his keyboards, which came much later. He entertained at family parties and social functions and many other places. As a family, we attended Padstow Heights Baptist Church. And until we got a car, I think we often walked from Picnic Point, some 3.5 kilometres in today's distance. Dad was always the best dresser. I honour him today. And he would wear his suit. There was something about the smell of his suit that I cannot forget. It has a feeling of comfort and security. And there's always cool mints in his pocket. Mum says he was very conscious of having fresh breath. I think. He had them to keep us kids quiet during the sermon, which he would often snore through. He would take them, try to take them out of his pocket as quietly as possible. I have given you all, every row, a packet of cool mints today. Please enjoy them quietly as possible, of course. Dad would often be asked to sing at church, and as we've heard, he had a wonderful tenor voice, and one of his favourites was the old rugged cross. And thank you, Rhonda, for singing that for us today. My dad was a man of honour and integrity, and he instilled those values of honour, loyalty, integrity, and honesty in us. He taught me through his example to care for others, to stand up for what was right, to show love like every day is the last day you will have the opportunity. He showed me the importance of a firm handshake, an even stronger hug that tells people that they are important and loved. His love was unconditional and he shared it with my mum us, his children, his grandchildren, and his great-grandchildren, and his friends. My dad was a legend, and I will miss him until I see him again in heaven. Thank you, Carolyn. And Graham, for those lovely memories of your dad. We're going to sing another song, The Saviour is Waiting. If you'd like to turn to the handout that's in your service. And if you'd like to stand with me or remain seating, please feel free. Keep you apart What is your answer? 
be seated. Well, that song was new to me, <laughs> so I thank Joyce and Alan for giving me the opportunity to learn it. Well, family and friends, we gather here today in both mourning and thanksgiving of a life that touched each of us in profound ways. In times of sorrow and loss, we often seek solace and guidance from the words of scripture. Today in our Bible readings, we have heard truth about and promises of Jesus. The promise Jesus gives is one of comfort and hope. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. These words remind us that life does not end with death. It transforms into a new beginning and speaks of our longing for an eternal home. As someone once said, we can face death with hope because it tells us that God would not allow our bodies, the work of his hands, to perish. As we remember Alan, we recognise the ways in which he embraced this hope. His journey on earth was a testament to his faith in Christ's promise of everlasting life. Alan understood that this world is not our final destination, but a temporary dwelling place on the way to something greater. Just as Jesus promised, Alan now resides in that prepared place where pain and suffering have given way to peace and joy. Jesus' promise is not purely about a physical place, but about being in the presence of the Saviour. Jesus' words assure us of his ongoing relationship with us, even after death. Jesus, who said of himself that he is the resurrection and the life, came to defeat that great enemy, death, and to give us abundant life, even after we leave behind our physical body. This is why in our sorrow, we can also find joy. Alan's life exemplified this unshakable joy. His faith allowed him to navigate life's challenges with courage and grace. He found comfort and strength in the assurance that Christ was preparing a place a place that he now inhabits in the company of our Lord. Alan's journey has transitioned from faith to sight, from hope to reality. As we remember Alan, let us also consider the impact he had on our lives. His legacy is one of love, kindness and compassion. He understood that the promise of eternity is not just for him alone, but for all who believe. As we heard in his story, the joy that he had in belonging to God is the one he wanted to share with others so that they too would know the peace that only God can give. Alan left an indelible mark on the lives he encountered, reflecting the light of Christ through his actions and words. His life was a living testimony to the transformative power of faith in Jesus Christ. In closing, let us hold on to the promise of John 14, 3. Let us find comfort knowing that Alan now experiences the fulfillment of this promise in the presence of our Saviour. As we grieve the loss of his physical presence, let us give thanks for his journey and the impact he made on this world. May the memory of Alan continue to inspire us to live lives of faith, hope and love. May we find solace in the truth that just as Alan rests in the presence of Christ, so too may we when our journey on earth ends. I'd now like to ask a friend of Alan's, George Hind, to bring us a poem, God's Garden. Thank you, George.
It's been not quite eight years since Alan came into my life. He actually came into my little dog's life first. <laughs> and I thought, who is that with my dog? <laughs> and um, that's where the friendship grew from. Over that time, Alan became a very close friend and companion, as did has Joyce. And this friendship grew deeper over the last five years or so, as I would often drive Alan to some of his medical appointments. At first, to John Hunter for his regular heart checkups. These trips were always full of jokes and laughter. And um, I just loved to tease him, and he loved being teased. And uh, I got as good as I gave. Some of the discussions were more serious, often about our Christian walk together and how we shared our life with Christ. In the last couple of years, I would take him to the Mater Hospital. These trips were more serious than the John Hunter ones, but still jovial. And I have to say that these trips were very precious and often very emotional. We would sometimes cry together, hold each other's hands, and talk about the future. Throughout this, Alan always said he was not afraid of dying. He knew where he was going, and he never wavered from that. And I, sometimes I feel a bit jealous that he's with my Lord, and I'm not. It was always, always an enormous blessing to be able to pray with Alan through some of these difficult times. Particularly when the news from the doctors was bad and difficult for Alan to understand and how to process that bad news. I've counted it a privilege and an honor to have walked with Alan through these difficult times. And I have to thank Joyce, Graham, and Caroline for that privilege of letting me do that. Because it's a, it is a very special thing. And it's something that I will cherish. Now, the poem that I am to read, and um, Graham asked me to do it because he didn't think he'd be able to do it because he'd get too emotional. I think, he got, I think he picked the wrong substitute. <laughs> the poem is called God's, God's Garden, and it's very apt for Alan's life. And on such a beautiful day, a very apt poem again. God's Garden. God looked around his garden and found an empty place. He then looked down upon the earth and saw your tired face. He put his arms around you and lifted you to rest. God's garden must be beautiful. He always takes the best. He knew you were suffering. He knew you were in pain. He saw the road was getting rough and the hills were hard to climb. So he closed your weary eyelids and whispered, peace be thine. It broke our hearts to lose you, but you didn't go alone, for part of us went with you the day God called you home. Thank you so much, George, for sharing your memories of Alan and how you took him to many visits with the doctor, and then for reading that poem. We're going to listen to another song chosen for this occasion, When We All Get to Heaven, played by Joan Corbett. Thank you, Joan.
could hear some of you singing that. You know it well. We sing it in chapel, don't we, Joyce? <laughs> I'd now like us to bow our heads as I pray a prayer of thanks for the life of Alan. Heavenly Father, thank you for the life of Alan Polk. Thank you that in 1959, Alan became a member of your family, personally accepting Jesus' sacrifice for his sin. Thank you that his joy in having a relationship with you was felt by others in his warmth, compassion and love. We ask that you would comfort those who will miss him deeply, his wife Joyce, son Graham and daughter Carolyn and their families. Please comfort his many friends who will miss his twinkling smile and his sense of humour. Thank you for the staff of Beth Shearn who cared for him in his last years. Their attention to his needs and their cheerful manner in which they supported him is appreciated by his family. We will miss Alan, but we do not grieve as those who do not have hope. For our sorrow is held alongside the assurance that Jesus is indeed the resurrection and the life. Gracious Father, may that give us the comfort that will sustain us in the days ahead. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you for your presence this afternoon.